Hey, y'all. Hope I'm not late. Oh, yeah, good. It's still seven o'clock. All right. Thanks for joining. And did you see my video on this is a rhetorical question? Did you see my video on the Ireland LLC strategies? I was wanting to talk a little bit more about that. So, yeah, you guys can record this and you can also change your name. Hey there, Ray. Hey, John. You just call me Stuka Pilot tonight. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Dive bomber. I'm going through the allow recording, allow recording, allow recording. I'll get through all that. So I, you know, I'm, we, we have all these interesting subjects. Last week we were talking about easements and really I just like to refer to it as property rights, but there's ways to use or affect the right, property rights. There's ways to use them. And so easements is one way. Um, the way we have easements set up, uh, we try to stay out of the court system. We use arbitration for that. Uh, and then we have the biometric security agreement. Okay, I know there's a, there's a a service uh, that was uh, this gentleman has. It was called um, what is it called? Uh, Self Governance U. Self Governance U. I don't know who that is, but he is talking about securing your biometric data. So I don't know what he's doing, but it looks like a variation of some of the work I'm doing. Mm, I can't connect with him because I don't see any contact information. But if we can connect with them, maybe we can get on the same page with some of this stuff. But anyway, so I had some a couple of uh, interested people from Ireland, and they were asking me about uh, using LLCs and those strategies for crypto tax, crypto tax avoiding, whatever, cryptographic currency. So what I'm talking about on these calls Thursday evenings um, is addressed in services I provide and video subscriptions. Now, I do produce other content besides these Thursday evening calls, but sometimes you'll find my parts of my Thursday evening calls in the content. But I do uh, produce new separate content that I put up into the uh, the video series as things come up or as I need to. Uh, and I try to do that on a regular basis. And that you'll find that at aceofcoins.club. Uh, and then, of course, aceofcoins.com, I still have it available to where you can schedule time with me and we can talk over stuff. But I like to address things through the... Um, the video membership. I know that's not possible to really answer everyone's questions. So anyways, I just want to mention those things. Um, of course, we have the Zunga.com and the Zunga.com. Ray is part of that. Mocha is part of that. And I'm in that team. And what we do is actual casework. So it's not possible to just sell you guys forms. I never want to do that. So we need people to be in the background that are going to be available to answer questions. So hopefully we're doing that. Uh, let's see. All right. Let's see here. So yeah, Jeff, I see that you have a note here. Uh, if I'm sorry, sometimes it's hard to get a hold of me. But anyways, um, what I did is I was, let me know if you can't hear me too well, because I just have my microphone. I think it's a pretty good microphone. Let me know. I can hear you fine. Super. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I have to get a headset or anything, but the microphone is yeah. good. All right. So uh, what I was doing is explaining the essence of holding property rights in a way that would avoid, legally avoid, the uh, any tax on the disposition of property. So people, uh, they identify with the phrase crypto tax, All right? There is no crypto tax. There's no tax on cryptographic currency, just like there's no tax on gold, just like there's no tax on property. Generally, there's no tax on property. Now people say, what about property tax? Okay, there's a valuation on it and you pay the tax in dollars, right? There's a valuation that you're paying the tax in dollars. The dollars are being taxed. The property is being used as a standard to collect the tax, to impose the tax, right? So... I'm talking about income tax on cryptographic currency or gold or stock or a business income or something like that. So specifically on cryptographic currency, which is the question that I'm talking about, I'm answering in the video regarding the Ireland, you know, LLC strategies, it's the same as in the States. I don't even talk about the laws. In fact, the questions weren't even based on specific Irish laws. There are such a laws. I'm sure there are taxes imposed on property and those taxes are paid in the local currency, but it's on the disposition of the property, okay? So the currency is being taxed, not the property. If the property were taxed, you'd pay the tax in the property. That's not even plausible, right? That's not even practical. Just like you wouldn't pay tax on gold, I use that term loosely, tax on gold by sending in some of your gold to the government. They wouldn't even accept it. They wouldn't even know what to do with it. You have to send it in Federal Reserve notes to pay tax on gold. And when would you do that? Well, when there's a disposition, right? When there's a value change, when you gained money is how they do it. So anyways, um, I I was just having a phone conversation uh, with a gentleman and we were talking about 
how there's so many people that over the years, and I think uh, since the 60s and the 70s, I think functions of our government have in, introduced certain stupid concepts into the population so that we'd be chasing our tails and fighting the tax system and not understanding what we're doing. And I think we're seeing that. And the tax protesters and the people that think they're effectively fighting the tax system by these theories and schemes and filing papers and revocation of election and nonsense like that and changing their residency and their citizenship and all that, they're just wasting their time and they're not being effective and they're making the government into more than it really is. The the, the people that work in the government are, are not that, they're not that smart. I mean, we don't want them to be. They're just following some rules, okay? Ray knows. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of shocking. You'd think that the Department of Justice is some scholars. What is it? What is it, Ray? It's like a bunch of seventh graders. <clears throat> it's a large team that bombards you with thousands of documents, pulls you, trying to confuse you, but they themselves are not on top of the procedure. And they use the all. judges to clean up their mess and their incompetence. The judges help them out. Really? I mean, just like in simple cases like this, I've you've seen before, Ray, where they come in there and they say, We've assessed a tax. Assessed, assessed, assessed. Okay, it's real simple. We don't have to talk about crazy tax protester theories. The government said there was a tax that was assessed, and that's why it wants its money. And so we say, fine, if you assess the tax and you're the government, you should have a record of that, right? If you go to the restaurant and you eat a nice meal, what, they they deliver a bill to you, don't they? I mean, usually it's got a list of the stuff that you ate. I would think it's called a <laughs> bill. It's an itemized bill, right? Well, the government's no different. The government is an insane person. It just is. It needs to be run by people that are not very smart. And some people are in the government are very smart. That's okay. I'm just saying... It's not intended to be run by very in, in, scholars, right? Not by not by that, because that that's why it has procedures and rules and things like that. So the the training time is low. All right. So here's where we are. The government comes in with a standard form it's been using for fifty or eighty years, and it says uh, the government's allay, uh, assess taxes, and we know there has to be a record of it. So we ask for a copy of it, and what do they come back with? Like Ray said thousands of pages of gobbledygook, whatever that means. I don't know if that's a real word, but you get the idea. They're not that smart. And yeah, okay, so you can still hurt people if you're not that smart. So we got to be smart to, to defend against it. But still, there you don't have to go out of your way too much. It's not much effort to not have a tax liability. All right, so here's where it comes down to. It doesn't have to do with the Constitution. It doesn't have to do with the tax code. I believe my theory now, here's a theory that I actually do have a theory on this. You remove Title 26 from the sphere of the tax system. And I think that the tax system would continue to operate as it is. That's my theory. I don't think they need it. But just the same, uh, you know, the, you, they're not that, they're not that uh, sophisticated. So how do we avoid a tax liability? Well, don't give the government a duty to reconcile. This is what I want to get to. Don't give the government a duty to reconcile an outstanding transaction without a balancing transaction. Well, I mean, let's not be ambiguous, okay? So if the government gets a 1099 and the 1099 was sent to a taxpayer, it's going to expect a tax return so the government can reconcile. The government can say, yep, everything looks good. We collected this much tax, or you owe, you're owed this much back, or you owe us more, whatever. They settle it because they, they that's the duty of the government. It's, it's an accounting function. Don't give the government a duty to reconcile, and you're not going to have a problem with it. Don't complain when you do give the government a duty to reconcile. It's just doing what it's supposed to do. Stop complaining. Figure out what you did to screw it up. Anyways, it's that simple. So in my video, I'll just, what is, who's asking what Title 26 is? Okay, guys, come on now. I'm trying to be a comedian. Title 26 of the United States Code. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> it's the Internal Revenue Code. And by the way, the Internal Revenue Code 
consists of Title 26 of the Internal Revenue Code and Title 27 of the Internal Revenue Code, the United States Code. Those are statutes, okay? That's the, the reduced version of the congressional enactments, okay? The public laws. They get written, rewritten into statutes. Title 26, United States Code, Title 27, United States Code, but they're not implemented until the agency itself, the IRS, writes and implements through the secretary or the director regulations that are within the purview of the statute. So the statute says to the IRS, you guys can do this because we said so, we're the Congress. And so the agency says, okay, we'll write a regulation that will do just that or less, but no more. So you got Title 26 and 27 of the U.S. Code, and you got Title 26 and 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations that are promulgated, as they say, by the actual agency. I know you guys know this stuff. So if that answers your question, I hope we're on the same page. All right. So don't give the government a duty to reconcile. Understand that you have property rights. And the example I gave in the in the thing on the in the presentation here is where uh, the your your business licensing office sends a letter with a tax return saying you got to fill out this tax return and tell us about all your property, the office furniture and stuff so we could tax it. So we could tax it. All right. Well, if you want to tax something, the reason why you want to tax is because you have a duty to tax. Excuse me just a second. A tax comes from a legal duty. A tax has to be paid. There's a legal duty to collect the tax, right? And there's an authority to do that, to carry that out. So if the government doesn't know what is to be taxed, isn't that the definition of you don't have a duty to act? If you don't know what's to be taxed, what are you doing? Why are you even talking about it? If it's not within your cognizance, then that's the definition of mind your own business. It's not something that gives the government a duty to act, a compelling interest. If I want to sit in my living room and get drunk, as long as I don't beat my children and hurt my neighbors or something, or try to hurt myself, I guess, too badly, uh, the, the government has no duty to act, right? You couldn't call the police on your neighbor and say, my neighbor's getting drunk in the living room. They would just say, stop calling us. <laughs> But if you're out, you know, if you're inebriated and you're outside swinging a bat, okay, that's different, right? So don't give the government a duty to act. It's that simple. Don't give them a duty to reconcile. What the heck? So if I have a limited liability company that's receiving money and it doesn't file a tax return, but it gets a 1099, the government doesn't care because it's unsettled funds. Why is it unsettled? What does that even mean? That means the money didn't arrive at its final destination. It's through, it's, it's still pending, let's just say. That means I can keep it floating around and I can use it, but I don't incur a tax liability because it doesn't constitute a gain. Because I just didn't file a report under penalty of perjury describing it as a gain. That's it. The whole system is based on you doing that. We're creating that. Just realize that's what's going on. Usually, if I, I recognize this with children, my, my wife and I recognize if we're we're observing some behavior that we don't like with our children most of the time when they're young enough most of the time it's because of something i did i've i've noticed that uh now my most of my, children, my children are grown mostly but when they were little i would actually recognize my own behavior in them and it was so obvious to me and i realized oh man i i didn't even realize i was training them to act like a jerk like i was acting you know so sometimes <laughs> many times if you're going to be complaining and whining about the government, it's probably because something you did, you know, you probably forgot. You probably didn't realize that you had a, pro a property right, that you're not treating as a private property right. If, if So what do you do in a situation where the business licensing office says, send us your a list of your, uh, your chattels, you send us a list of your office equipment and stuff so we can tax it. And you should write a letter back and say, okay, well, um, I fill out this tax return but I need to know what you want to tax. So if you would please provide me with the list of the things you want to tax. Now that sounds like a smart ass letter and it kind of is, but you're demonstrating the point that if you don't know, then you can't tax it. So the, the response should be, which they're not gonna answer you, 
But the response should be, well, we don't have the list of things that we want to tax. And so my response to that is, well, isn't that the definition of private property, which is not taxable? Anyways. <laughs> yeah, so you guys have a, a better understanding. Yeah. So, yeah. Good explanation. Yeah, I like my little metaphors, analogies. I know they're stupid sometimes, but I'm sorry. I just, I just have to say it different ways. But we have so so many uh, pr uh, property rights. We have the right to enter into a contract, and then we have the rights expressed in the contract. The right, for example, the right to enter into a contract is a property right. It's a property right. The my well, I mean, intellectual property is one thing too. I mean, that's that's an aspect of intangible property. You know, um, anyways, I don't want to get too far off into casework, but you get the idea. I, you know, I, we could do questions and answers. I don't want to take up the, the time too much, but somebody's asking a question. So Karen's asking uh, for the LLC, did you get client W9? There's no cross checking with uh, W9. The W9, okay, here's the only thing that's important. Who cares about the address? Sometimes it can be a phony address, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that when you're supposed to be getting mail somewhere, that whoever's sending you mail, they, the person knows where to send it. That, that, the W9, you know, you can change the address all you want. The purpose of the W9 is to certify the correctness of the EIN that was assigned to the entity. What that does is you're certifying under penalty of perjury, and I'm gonna get a little technical here. If you read it carefully, you'll see this, you'll be able to track what I'm saying. You're avoiding a situation of backup withholding and you're passing off the liability to correctly report to the payor. This is every benefit to you. If you're using an entity that doesn't file, it's every benefit to you to use a W-9 to make sure that whoever's reporting is not gonna do it incorrectly. And you're gonna avoid backup withholding. A backup withholding is an accounting function that withholds money when there's no filing of a tax return. In order to get the money back, you have to file a tax return. And I'm really wondering why the IRS hasn't done that. Maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, but why hasn't the IRS done that with cryptos? I can answer that question there because there's no tax liability. Because if there was, the IRS could and would do backup withholding. Guys, go look it up. 26 USC section 3406. Go look up the form for it and all that, okay? So that, that's another way to confirm what I'm saying is right. There's no tax on cryptos because they would be doing backup withholding. Why not? If there really was. All right, so when transferring money between LLCs, can it be done freely? Yeah, just move money around. If I if my LLC makes a bunch of money and then I take some of that and I go buy a car with it and then I use another LLC to own the car, I'm just moving money from one LLC to another and the LLC owns the car or it's a trust or whatever. Or if I buy the car with the LLC's money in my name, if I stop there, then it's my income, right? Because it's a personal expense most of the time. So in order to avoid that, I would put a lien on the on the car, on the vehicle, and maybe the LLC would be the lien holder, right? Maybe, or something would, somebody would. The money has to be the loan, okay? So if it's a loan, then it's not, doesn't turn into taxable income, right? So that's how you do it, yeah. You don't need contracts and gifting and all this other stuff. Yeah, can't, a capital contribution, that's another way to understand. I could put money into an LLC, and then I can move it to another LLC, yeah. Capital, contribution, that's not taxable. Buying stuff, that's not taxable. The guy selling it, he might have a tax liability. All right. Does that help? So you so you guys like to a ask questions by chat, that's fine. Anybody wanna ask me something? Anything complex? Moving our, uh, amounts over 10K. I don't know if 10K, okay, so moving money around that's over 10K, I don't know that that's a, a thing. I think just moving money around with unusual amounts and unusual uh, uh, activity, that gets FinCEN involved more than the IRS. And the IRS doesn't get involved in those things. So it's not $10,000 like you see in the movies. It's not 3,000, it's anything. It's anything unusual. The blockchain tax immunity trust. These are all buzzwords I use in marketing. But what I'm describing is something that people aren't really considering. If you take cash and put it on a crypto exchange, the crypto exchange is not changing the the wallet, moving coins from one wallet to another. That would be too expensive. What it's doing is having its software 
keep track of on a ledger, keep track of your buys and sells. You're not really buying and selling. So when you put money on Coinbase, for example, and you buy Bitcoin, what uh, what Coinbase does is it it does trade the it sells you the Bitcoin, so to speak. It sells you the Bitcoin. So you're buying Bitcoin, and it puts it in a wallet that you have the access to the wallet. I wouldn't say you have access to the wallet. What you have is the ability to record a, a trade of that crypto coin. You can trade it for other coins and whatnot. But you're not actually the ownership of the crypto coin. The ownership at Coinbase is that Coinbase owns the Bitcoin that you just bought. You think you bought Bitcoin, but you didn't because you don't have the private keys. That's the test. You have the private keys, right? Private keys equal possession. Possession equals ownership. You don't have the private keys. You're not going to get them. Fine. That's actually helpful because that makes Coinbase the trustee of your property. So how can you possibly be liable for taxes if it's not your property? It's in a trust. <laughs> That's the nature of the transaction, guys. You don't have to do anything. It's already there. You're just fooled and not understanding that. So when you're trading Bitcoin for other coins and whatnot, are you really doing that? Nope. And nor is Coinbase for that matter. And ironically, what I just told you is what I described to the IRS to get them to agree that the erroneous 1099 that, that people were dealing with years ago should be excluded from your 1040, should be excluded from your 1040. The IRS says that. What? What? The IRS agrees when I say to it, Therefore, I believe the, 10, the 1099 is erroneous and should be excluded from the 1040. And the taxpayer, I use that term, is not subject to backup withholding. This is what I tell the IRS. And the IRS says, we agree. What the heck? So that's what I mean by blockchain tax immunity trust, okay? When these exchanges came out and they were asking for the KYC and people were freaking out. And I looked at it and I said, guys, don't freak out. It's there's no there's no conveyance here. There's no there's no gain anywhere because there's no ownership changing hands. You're just moving the property over in, into a trust. You guys love this, right? Everybody talks about trust organization. You're given a trust. OK, the trust collapses when you take your money off Coinbase. <laughs> so you're given this trust and. There's no tax liability. And so I, I thought, well, let me put my money where my mouth is. Let me just, let's get the IRS to agree with me. Let me just ask them. So I took my theory and I wrote a letter to the IRS on the IRS's form. And I said, hey, look, here's a transaction. I described it just like I just told you guys. The IRS said, yep, you're right. After like 25 times, the IRS finally mishandled, started mishandling my request. So I said, oh, forget it, guys. Just, just don't file it. Don't put the 1099 on your 1040. They know what to do. <laughs> I don't have to uh, grandstand anymore. When you relocate your funds from an exchange or a wallet. Okay, so like if I take a gold coin out of this pocket and I put it over here, or if I told my brother, hey, can you hold my gold coin for me and I'll get it back after my vacation and I come and get it back and I put it in my pocket. Is that the same thing as moving from the exchange to a, a hot or cold wallet where I control the private keys? I think so, right? The best way to allocate, I've always told people, you go onto Coinbase with your money, right? And you transfer it without allocating it onto your atomic wallet or whatever you like, your ledger or whatever, your bit five, and then you allocate it. Or Caleb and Brown, I prefer them. Then you allocate it off of the exchange. Then use the exchange for liquidating it. How do you track that? Why are you allocating it on an exchange with erroneous software? <laughs> we gotta think this stuff through. It's not that hard. Can we get a copy of the letter to the IRS? Yeah, everybody asked for that. I did a video on it. It's in my membership area. And one of my clients was nice enough to send me one, was nice enough to send me the response. So I can tell you, more than half of the time, the IRS did not respond to my letter, I have to say. They just didn't do anything when my client excluded the 1099 from his 1040. And I'll just tell you, I know that's sealed in cement right now because that was back from 2017 I was doing this. In 2014, in 2015, I went to the IRS and I asked it for the form letter I need to get a determination letter. And I had been using that same letter up until like last year. And I just finally just stopped. I, enough is enough, okay? Yeah. 
Okay, so the okay, so if you look at my my legal conclusion in the in the letter, which I believe is published in my videos. In fact, I gave you everything. It's in my videos. It tells you in there what I'm doing now. I'm gonna describe it again, okay, for you in Australia or other countries. So you you move property that's your private property. You move it onto a, a you 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 go through a service that's gonna provide a service to you that it's easy for it to do rather than you do it. So you go to the service like a bank, right? But this time we're going to use a, co a coin exchange, a, a crypto coin exchange. So the exchange, the way it operates is it takes ownership of the property. So you get, you put money into the exchange and it will place the property and let's call it a purchase into your ability to control a record of it, but not actually change the ownership of it. So the exchange takes ownership of the property that was used to you to acquire through your uh, money, through your cash, okay? As you're moving that around from coin to coin or whatever on the software of the exchange, the ownership is staying the same the whole time, right? So in, I believe in most countries, correct me if I'm wrong, it's the disposition of property. And to dispose of property, you need two disinterested parties, two different people or entities with different interests. So if I, is it possible for me to sell coins to my wife? Nope. Is it possible to sell coins to someone in my household who depends on me? Nope. <laughs> There's no disposition of property. But if I sell to some other stranger guy, okay, on the exchange, all right, then there, there probably is. But the way it works on the exchange is there's no sale until you pull the property off and or you take dollars out. What if you don't? What if you move it off the exchange, right? That's when you get into this, you know, they want to make these reports. They're all erroneous because they can't make that conclusion that it was a game just because you moved it from the wallet on Coinbase to your off offline wallet. But they do, but it's erroneous. If that answers your question. But so if you're if you're in Australia, it works the same way, right? Even with Caleb and Brown. I I mean, check their software. I think their software is the same thing. They become the trustee. That exchange becomes the trustee, the owner, the owner with you as the beneficiary, okay, the account holder. You're 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 paying for the service, right? So you're the you're the beneficiary of the trust. The exchange is the trustee and the owner of the property, and it never relinquishes ownership no matter what you do until you move it off the exchange. So I hope that helps you.